It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a privilege. Uh, thanks to the organizers for having me here. Um, what we're going to talk about today is uh, competencies of great product managers. Um, and uh, it may sound sort of self-serving that I'm saying, oh, here I am on a stage, you know, talking about competencies of great managers, great product managers. Um, honestly, I, wouldn't, I don't yet consider myself a truly great product manager. Um, so a lot of this talk is informed by my journey, my personal journey um, at Uber and other companies, uh, observing and learning from uh, what I consider to be uh, great transformative PMs. And with the goal of helping uh, you all here sort of understand that and figure out how can those principles be actionable for your place where you're at. Um, that's the goal here. So what I want to first talk about is, is my own story. Uh, and uh, uh, I am currently head of product at a company called Skip Scooters. Skip is uh, the light blue electric scooters you may have seen around town. Uh, I have my, my helmet here, um, safety first. So make sure if you ever use these, you're, you're wearing the helmet. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the transportation industry. Before Skip, um, I was a product lead at Uber. Um, so I was at Uber for five years during some of the most intense, crazy hyper growth time. So a bit about that story. Um, when I joined Uber, this is like towards the end of 2013. It was mostly a black car company. Uh, this is back when, yeah, you'd literally get a limousine or a nice like Mercedes Benz a black car show up at your doorstep. Um, UberX was just getting started. And then of course, after that, the rest is history. There was Uber Pool, there's Uber Eats, there's autonomous cars and so on. But I joined pretty early on. My mother, uh, when I was signing the offer, she was like, why are you joining a, a, a taxi company? Um, and I, I hope she's proud of me now, I guess. <laughs> All right, so the story at Uber was uh, our version of Moore's Law. It was almost like Uber's Law. It was this idea of like 2x every six months, every metric you can think of, um, whether it's trips, uh, city launches, uh, uh, revenue, employee headcount, cost. It's possible that cost was actually increasing more than 2x every six months, <laughs> uh, probably. Uh, but it was, it was, it was hypergrowth. And I remember my manager early on telling me, um, just meeting expectations uh, in that kind of environment means that you have to 2x yourself every six months. And at the time, I didn't really know what that meant. I didn't, like, what does that actually mean to 2x yourself? Like, how do you think about that? That problem. But anyways, I kind of tucked that uh, sort of on the side and I worked on a couple projects. This is one I'm, I'm really, really proud of. It was called Destination Entry um, and Driver Turn by Turn Navigation. So if you remember a time, you'd uh, get an Uber. Uh, you couldn't actually you'd tell your driver where to go. You'd actually like talk to them and then they would fumble around with Waze or Google Maps and then type it in and then you're off. So this feature was as a rider before your trip begins. You enter your destination, Driver gets it, uh, and they have it integrated with in-app turn-by-turn navigation. So a very seamless experience. And it sounds obvious now, but you know, five, six years ago, it, it wasn't there. Um, the, the feature went really well. Um, it, was a, it was a home run. And the you know, people were using it. Riders really liked it. You didn't have to speak anything to your driver. Uh, much more seamless for drivers. Um, it turns out that in 2014, this is the biggest product launch to have unlocked our international markets where you don't speak the same language as your driver. So when you put this in, it's all localized for them. Uh, so really, really incredible. So I don't say this to toot my own horn. Uh, actually, much to the opposite. Um, I remember after this, uh, this product launch, I was ready to have that conversation with my manager. You know, I'd be like, okay, let's talk about a promotion. <laughs> And uh, uh, that conversation did not go well. <laughs> um, he basically was like, uh, you're, you're, not, you're not meeting the expectations of a senior product manager. And I was super deflated. Um, I didn't know why. Like, it wasn't clear for me from that conversation. He said things like conviction and vision and this and that. But I was like, I just shipped this incredible project. Like, of course I deserve a promotion. But that didn't happen. So um, I wondered, you know, why am I not getting promoted? Um, 
what does PM success really mean? Uh, and how am I actually performing? Not just what I think that's in my head, but how do I have that conversation with, with my manager? And so I wanted answers. So during my time at Uber, um, I was sort of always in the search for like, what does that playbook mean for product? Um, and uh, it turns out that my managers, uh, and I had a lot of them at the company, um, they didn't exactly have the answers for me. They couldn't tell me uh, very tactically what product uh, success meant. So what I did, I ended up just kind of piecing it together. I talked to a lot of the folks within Uber, uh, folks who had had backgrounds from companies like Google, Amazon, et cetera. And uh, during my time at Uber, I uh, created the PM competencies. This is a very long uh, document. Well, technically it's a spreadsheet. Um, and it is the rubric used to calibrate and level all product managers at Uber. Uh, uh, and it's still there to this day being used. So I'm really proud of that. Um, uh, and what I want to do is share that, a, a simplified version of that framework with you all today. Um, so let's, uh, let's jump in. So PM competencies. Uh, a few things that, that we want to answer here are, what is the PM role? And what are the key skills to doing that role well? And now what I want to acknowledge before I jump in is I am also in my own journey as a PM. So for me, a lot of what I'm about to talk about is in some ways a North Star for myself. Um, and we'll go into examples for me if I were to do a self-assessment where I stand. So uh, the PM role. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen or read uh, different frameworks for what the product manager role means. Uh, this is my version of it. Uh, very basically, um, First and foremost, you are the advocate for the customer. End of story. If there is a room of people and everyone's kind of debating what should be done, what product should we build, et cetera, you are that person in the room who wants to do the right thing for the customer, who really deeply understands the customer. And so that is, that's the first principle. The second principle is you create value for that customer with products. The vehicle for you to make the change uh, you know, for your customers, whether it's uh, entertainment, it's uh, utility, whatever it is, it's through this thing called a product. And product can be very loosely defined. It could be digital, it could be hardware, it could be an education curriculum, and so on. The third principle is that you ship products by leading cross-functional teams. This is important. Now, if you were, if it was just us, right? If it was just you and you had an idea for a product, you know who the customer is, and you're building it yourself, uh, that's not really the whole, the whole picture that you get when you're doing product management in, a, in an organization. There's a lot of just uh, skill sets involved, people involved, horse trading of priorities and this and that, and that's what makes the product role really hard. So again, as we think about customer, products, and teams, and, and this idea of leadership, these themes will weave in uh, pretty consistently when we talk about the PM competencies, and these are the things that we'll pivot on. Does that make sense? All right, so uh, let's jump into the framework. Um, all right, so what we're gonna do is talk about four key pieces, vision, um, execution, leadership, and technical ability. Um, there are probably many other ways of saying these words or framing this, but these are the ones I'm gonna go with. Uh, so what we'll do is kind of walk through what each of these means in turn uh, and uh, give you some examples. So let's first talk about product vision. Product vision is the why. If you've heard of the framework, uh, PMs really are responsible for the what and the why. This is the why. And oftentimes the why comes and should come before the what. Now what does the why mean? The why means you are responsible for defining uh, the vision, the strategy of some area, product, feature, whatever kind of scope of it is. Now, just delivering a document isn't the answer. The question is like, where does that competence come from? How do you deliver on such a strategy or, or vision? Well, again, like I said before, it starts with the customer. It starts with deeply understanding the customer, living their shoes, talking to them, and so on. Uh, and that is, that, is, that is the starting point. The second is understanding the business. 
So, of course, the organization in which we work may have financial constraints. It might have resourcing constraints. It might have uh, marketing constraints and so on. As PMs, we have to really understand uh, all aspects of the business we're operating in because those are the constraints we use to formulate the product we will build for that customer. Um, so with an understanding of the customer and an understanding of the business constraints, uh, you're able to define a product strategy. And this is sort of the culmination of what it means to you know, uh, have vision, so to speak. It's not about speaking words from the top of a hill to be like, oh, and there will be an iPad, and there will be you know, uh, you know, Amazon Prime. Uh, it's not like that. It's about saying, look, this is the North Star. This is sort of like where the world is moving. Uh, we know this because we see some of this in our customers and their needs and pain points. Here's where we are today. And here are the products we need to build to get from here to there. And the order in which we do it, here's the customers we're going to target for that at each step of the way. Here's uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of the, the tactical strategy for how we're going to go about that. And that strategy, I would say, is sort of the, the, the culminating piece of, uh, of the vision portion. So that's, uh, that's a little bit about, about the vision. So execution. Now this is the what. This is what you're going to go build. So you've defined the why. Now if we stop there, then obviously we're not really doing our jobs. It's about actually going out and materializing the strategy, the vision that, that you had just put together. Now the what uh, first is PMs ship products. We ship products that customers love. So there's elements of we're part of the shipping cycle. Uh, we set a really high bar for what goes out the door. And uh, what goes out is useful and uh, delightful for the customers it serves. Um, now, it doesn't mean that we're doing, especially in larger organizations, it doesn't mean that we're doing every single little thing and testing every like nook and cranny of the product or uh, you know, actually tactically working with the team to get it out the door. There might be other functional roles for doing that. But at the end of the day, the PM is accountable uh, for uh, success of that product in those ways. Now, the second point here around execution is managing high-velocity teams. Um, to that earlier point of how we end up building product is through uh, uh, working with cross-functional teams. Um, this uh, means we play the role that needs to be played to really maximize the, the throughput, the output, the quality of the people we work with. In the end, we're not building it. Uh, there are other functional roles that are actually building uh, the product, especially, again, like I'm talking about a little bit larger companies. Startups might be a little bit different. Um, and so whether it's sprint planning, it's tackling and blocking, it's uh, you know, playing roles outside of uh, the traditional PM role, um, I feel like that, that notion of the PM as sort of uh, the hy hydrator in chief, the, the, water cool the water boy or water girl, or the idea of uh, PMs not as quarterbacks but as blockers, um, that doesn't get enough air cover. And that's this, this point about managing high velocity teams is trying to represent a few of those things. Uh, the third point here is rapidly learning with experimentation. And uh, so when we say experimentation, a lot of times people think of it of running A-B tests, like the way Facebook does or Netflix does, Uber certainly did. Um, what I mean by this is uh, experimentation at every step of the product discovery process. So even in uh, UX research or in the design process, you can do a lot of fast iteration and experimentation. Um, as, a, as a product manager, we are trying to learn quickly, not wait for the big bang product releases uh, to get feedback on what's working and what's not. So oftentimes, uh, especially earlier in the product development process, we are leading and driving that iteration, that, that rapid learning. Leadership uh, is the third category. So leadership is uh, this idea that um, we don't operate in a vacuum. Uh, the way we affect change uh, and build product is with people. And it's not just the teams that we work with. 
It's the organizational context in which we operate. Uh, so as a leader, um, as a product manager, we own the problem, however complex it may be. Um, we are problem owners. Um, and what that phrase kind of refers to is, you know that, that feeling you get in a room where everyone's like, okay, so who's gonna do X? And then there's this like complete dead silence. It's super awkward, but the PM is kind of that person who will like raise up their hand and be like, yeah, I'll, I'll take that on. Like I got this and really own the problem all the way through. It's, it's just, it's more like an attitudinal thing. Now, more tactically, uh, communicating and building trust is a key part of what makes leadership work for product managers. It's communication leftwards, rightwards, upwards, downwards, you know, diagonal, outside, inside. It's communication in every way. So that competency and that skill, being able to communicate well, um, is super, super important. Um, and a part of communication is building trust. Uh, it's building that interpersonal connection with the people around us. Um, and it may be through one-on-ones, might be through executive reviews, could be through uh, presentations we give to people, but that idea of building trust uh, is, is there. And finally, obtaining help to get things done. Uh, this is another point I think doesn't get enough uh, airtime in uh, what it means to be successful as a PM. Um, who here has ever felt like they've had enough resources to get the, pro get the job done? Have you ever felt that way? <laughs> you have? Okay. That's amazing. <laughs> Tell me your secret. <laughs> Large company. Large company. Okay. There you go. Uh, I, having come from like a startup background, uh, I, I have rarely ever had that feeling. Um, and when I know I have that feeling, I have enough resources, I'm like, okay, time for me to walk away. <laughs> uh, no, but the idea of obtaining help to get things done is uh, resources are limited and we have to be scrappy and uh, resourceful in terms of how we get help. Now, of course, an obvious way to get help is to go find people and recruit them. Um, uh, recruiting is hard and finding really great people is hard, so it's not a quick fix. Um, other ways to get help is to talk to other leaders and managers in the organization. Uh, Tell them your vision and your strategy and why it's so compelling for the company and use that soft influence to be like, hey, if you if there have any extra resources or people are looking for interesting projects, I have this really cool one over here. Right? That's just an example of something that you can do to create leverage for yourself. Um, and ideally do it in a way where it doesn't create politics. Um, but obtaining help to get things done uh, is, is a key one. Uh, I actually struggle with it a little bit, um, but want to call that out as well. And finally, technical depth. Uh, technical depth, in my mind, is table stakes for the product role. Now, when I say technical depth, uh, one might think I'm referring to, okay, do I need a computer science degree, you know, or do I need to know how to write Python code or SQL this or that? Uh, no, like that's not necessarily what I'm saying here. Um, what I'm referring to by technical depth is whatever skills are needed to make a product, whatever product you're building, could be a super technical one, could be digital, could be hardware, again, it could be an education product like a curriculum. Uh, you understand how the sausage gets made. You understand how that product gets built. Um, so. It could mean that you have a design background, that you have uh, you know, a software engineering background, that you have a hardware background, or you have an operations background, marketing background, investing background, right? But the point is, you know how that product gets made. Um, so the second point here is you're able to collaborate with cross-functional peers. Um, so understanding the process by which each key function needed to build the product, how they work, how they're supposed to work, what their inputs are needed, what their outputs are, how those outputs weave into the inputs of other functions to, in the end, make this product. Um, as PMs, we need to deeply understand that process and in many cases, drive it because you know the, the show has to keep going on uh, to actually get a product out the door. And finally, uh, editing the team's work. It's not just you, 
you know how uh, the sausage gets made. Uh, you have an opinion on what quality looks like at each uh, functional layer of the product. So I know as a PM if I am uh, building an autonomous car. I was working on autonomous cars at, at Uber for a couple of years. Uh, well, uh, it's not just the end user experience of being in the car as a passenger. Safety is really important. Measuring safety is important. So being able to work with data science and uh, 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 safety engineering and a bunch of other functions to make sure we've hit that bar before we ship something, that's really, really important. So anyway, so that's a bit about technical depth. Um, and with that, that kind of rounds out the, the framework. Vision, execution, leadership, technical. I'm going to pause here. That was a mouthful. Um, does that make sense? You guys have any questions on, on that? Yeah. Question. You said that this framework might be different for small teams. What do you mean? Yeah, uh, so the question was, uh, I said I, I, this framework may be different for small teams. Um, what I meant by that as a, as a product manager for a smaller startup, or let's say you're the CEO of a, of a startup, and you tend to play the, the product hat uh, for a while, um, it's very possible that you are doing a bunch of things that are not just product management. You might be the CTO as well, in which case you're actually doing the engineering work. Um, so this framework is more about, uh, uh, and when I talk about having teams or functional roles and this and that, it kind of assumes the existence of there's a team, you know, that actually does the building. How, how do you build the vision? Where, where do you draw the line? Yeah, so the question is how do you build a vision and where do you draw the line? Um, that's a great question. Um, because like I said, vision could mean many different things. Uh, so I'll answer... Um, I'll answer tactically, like what are kinds of things you can produce to demonstrate a vision? Um, and again, depending on where you're at and what team you're on and the need, uh, which of those tactics you leverage might be unique. So uh, I'm a fan of Marty Kagan's. Uh, so uh, he talks about, like he, he wrote that product, uh, um, How to Build Products Customers Love. Um, so he talks about the PM, the PM role. Um, and some of his, uh, his feedback on things you do to kind of drive clarity around vision and strategy. Uh, you could write the Amazon press release, you know, and work backwards from this fake press release around a product area. Um, and the idea here is you're saying, here's the value to the customer. So again, put the customer, you know, front and center, and then say, working backwards from that, um, uh, here's the benefit we're gonna provide, here's the solution we're gonna provide, here are the features, here's sort of customer testimonials, quotes in this press release. So where there is a heavy customer, especially kind of like out, outwards customer uh, part of the product, I found that the Amazon style press release really helps. Um, where there is a UX um, that you just, you can only uh, communicate the value of something if you see it. Like it's so hard to write certain things in words and documents uh, and communicate the value of it. Sometimes it's actually not a press release that helps. It's just a prototype. It's a North Star prototype. Um, the prototype could be a conceptual design mock. It could be uh, a, a working prototype. It could be with some real data if it's an analytics tool. But that, that can help as well to kind of communicate the, the idea and the point. Uh, other techniques, white papers, uh, 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 you know, business model canvases, things like that. There's a whole bunch of options there. All right, so, so this is the framework. Um, so that was all fine and great, but the question I was asking, certainly at Uber, was, okay, even with these competencies, how do I become a better PM at the end of the day? How, what does growth mean like for me? Um, and so I'm going to break this down into a few uh, topics. One is, um, how do we think about superpowers and our strengths? Um, how do we think about development areas, so things we need to get better at? Where do we draw inspiration around that from? And with both of those things, uh, and the job to be done for the product role, how do we think about setting goals, uh, measuring our success, and sort of getting better as PMs? That's sort of like gonna be our culmination point of, a, uh, of the talk today. So uh, I had to, I couldn't do a product talk and not put in a canonical Steve Jobs uh, picture. So here you go, you're welcome. Um, 
So the question I wanted to pose here, uh, and invite feedback on, is when you think of Steve Jobs, uh, what superpowers did, uh, did Jobs have? One could think he was kind of like a product manager, right? Yeah. He focused a lot about design and what's the best customer experience. So focused on design and what was the best customer experience. So very kind of customer driven. Uh, but he didn't necessarily do everything customers said, right? Yeah, but he gave, like the neatest product and he also went to Pixar leader for that design principles that he owned. Yeah, so also had his role in, in Pixar. Yep, absolutely. What else? Yeah. It seemed like he knew what people wanted before they did it. So it seems like he knew what people wanted before they asked for it. Yeah. Yep. Visionary. So visionary. It's definitely a word that comes to mind. There's someone over here. Okay, visionary. Yeah. He created a. Created something that people uh, something that people didn't know they needed until they actually had it. Yep. Yeah. So he imagined what could be possible, um, but it wasn't just in his head, right? He was talking about it. He was communicating. I would say one of Steve Jobs' biggest strengths was storytelling. You know, it was the fact that he could inspire people by what could be possible what the customer need was, what even the market needed, and then just tell a phenomenal story. Um, it's incredible. Um, the other example is Jeff Bezos. So less, uh, you know, like uh, uh, maybe familiar to a lot of people, but what words come to mind if you've kind of been following Amazon's story or, or Jeff? Yeah. Relentless. Relentless, okay. That was What's that? that was that's true. Uh, Amazon's uh, first domain, true story, was relentless.com. That's so crazy. <laughs> Pretty messed up, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Anything else to describe uh, Bezos? Short-sighted. Short-sighted. Interesting. Yeah. Tell, tell us more. <laughs> yeah, so, um, the ramifications of his decisions and the impact on society, he fails to recognize, and it's very obvious with the way that he's treated his employees, right? When you start to alienate your employees, it alienates the experience, it alienates the customers. Now we've got an atmosphere where Amazon's constantly in the news as a result of these short-sighted, fiscally-oriented decisions. Yeah. Um, one could say Uber had many of you know similar problems like that, mm -hmm. for sure. Even though I get my news from a comedian, but Hassan did it. Amazon uh, story, but I think he talked about they wanted to give customer satisfaction at the moment, even though they were losing market share, and that's what's the key of their business, is they're willing to lose their long-term, they were focusing on their long-term profit, and they're willing to lose their short-term. Yeah. yeah, so focus on the customer. This is one of Amazon's kind of key uh, principles, is customer obsession. Um, and probably Bezos is, uh, yeah, definitely not a perfect uh, leader. So I don't put him up here as sort of a conception of perfection as a leader. But uh, customer obsession is absolutely a core value that I think differentiates Amazon from a lot of other companies. Well, I think one of the big things is discipline. It's extremely discipline when it comes to stock pattern. Yeah. Yeah. So the reason, the reason we're talking about this is we're, we're, we're finding adjectives and words to come out with superpowers, right? The whole, the whole idea here is, can we draw inspiration from people like Jeff and Steve? Uh, recognize that across this framework here, it's not like they checked the box across the board. Like one could argue that Steve Jobs was a terrible executor. You know, like he couldn't deliver products on time. He needed help from folks like Tim Cook and, uh, and other team members to really get him to kind of constrain and focus and ship. At the same time, Jeff Bezos, um, you know, uh, has a lot of vision, uh, uh, relentlessly executes the quality, I would say, of certain things that Amazon has shipped, not, not the best thing in the world. Um, and Bezos himself has a lot of things to work on. But the point is, um, 
there are superpowers there. And one can draw inspiration from the PM competencies to say, hey, what do, what do I do well, right? On the flip side, we can also draw inspiration from this framework to say, what could I do better at? What are kind of competencies or skills? When I'm trying to draft my goals or like areas of professional development, um, one can look back at this and say, all right, here are the ways I need to improve. So what's an example of this? I'm going to uh, open up myself to, to all of you and talk about my strengths and weaknesses uh, publicly. Um, I actually did this exercise uh, seven or eight months ago when I was leaving Uber and joining Skip. Um, joined Skip as a head of product, a uh, really fancy title. Um, honestly, it was a little bit scary to me because um, I wasn't sure what that all meant. But what I did was sort of this uh, reflection of, okay, well, strengths and weaknesses, superpowers and development areas. And then I used, uh, mapped it against the PM competencies to say, well, what am I going to bring to this role that's really like it's going to help propel me and help me be successful? And what are the areas I know I have to work on? Um, so a few of those things were on the product vision side. Well, I've been a transportation user, obviously. I live here in San Francisco. Uh, I started using scooters every single day. So I wanted to make this thing work. So that idea of customer obsession, well, I was the customer. Um, the second is industry knowledge. So that's the transportation knowledge strategy. And so with that, uh, I had a pretty good idea of like what needs to happen in scooters to make this successful. On execution, I've got the startup background and I'm joining a startup. Uh, I've shipped software product before, so there was all good things. Um, and focusing on the other positives, on the leadership side, uh, I would say storytelling is, uh, I've been told at least, is one of my strengths. Uh, I've been told by my team members that they really enjoyed me as a manager. Now they, may could, they could be buttering up, but uh, <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, and then also on the technical depth side, I have a software background, CS degree, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, data science, you know, worked with data science teams pretty extensively. But when dealing with a transportation product and hardware, um, that background's really important. I don't have that. And so when I think about being a head of product for a, uh, a company like Skip, I knew I was going to have to work on those areas. So. I don't have the background of shipping hardware product. Um, so on the execution angle, that's going to be important for me as I think about what success looks like. Um, and then on the technical side, I haven't built uh, hardware and electronics, uh, consumer electronics products before. So it's something I'm going to have to learn while I'm on the job. Um, and that's OK. That's totally fine. And then the third one was getting help from others. I'm so <coughs> used to being in startups where I have like limited resources that I tend to like put everything on myself and then not go out and seek help and, 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 and get that. Uh, and that's something I know in a leadership role, I'm especially going to have to work on. So this was, for me, how I used the PM competencies to basically map out strengths and areas for improvement. Now, with this, um, this is one way to basically call out development areas, things that you would want to appear in a conversation with your manager around goals. There's another thing we have to keep in mind, though, and that is success isn't necessarily, um, there isn't a common notion of success across every type of product manager persona. Um, so as you may know for the PMs in the room, uh, PM could mean something totally different in one company versus another one. There's different types. So the examples I'm going to give here, uh, growth product management, what does this mean? Well, you're in a very data-driven uh, company, the product you're building relies on understanding the user experience funnel or uh, the acquisition funnel, and you're looking for these opportunities to run A-B tests and make incremental improvements in that funnel. That's a lot of what kind of like growth product management uh, could entail. So people with data backgrounds, uh, uh, even consulting or investing backgrounds, those, uh, those uh, could very well help you in that role. Marketing. Marketing is kind of like at Apple. Apple doesn't really have as much product management. Uh, it's more like marketing, uh, a product marketing. And what that means is uh, pricing, positioning, packaging. Uh, that's really where the product role kind of like comes in. You're thinking about strategy, like market selection, uh, customer segmentation, what products could we build for said customers. And so people with backgrounds in uh, marketing, strategy, et cetera, management consulting, uh, especially 
that makes sense for that. And the PM competencies that are relevant for a role where it's more of a marketing PM role, those kind of change. You're more on the vision side, less on the execution and get it out the door side, right? Uh, UX, where you are the person who is actually responsible for the end user experience. Um, so you're working on a mobile app. You're a mobile product manager. Um, that's where um, your, your idea of setting a vision is about that prototype, right? It's about painting a North Star, not with words, but show me. Show me the, uh, the concept. And so you get in at that level of detail. You know how that thing gets made. Um, and you're very familiar with how to, how to get this thing out the door. Platform PMs are, uh, this is a toolbox here. Uh, you build tools for other, other teams, whether they're internal or external. So folks with B2B backgrounds and uh, who are, know sort of the process of getting customers successful with B2B products, that's a lot of there. And R&D, more, more technical roles. Again, technical depth, uh, that competence is weighted a lot more than necessarily setting a vision. Um, so anyways, the whole point of showing this is uh, the weight you put on certain competencies changes based on the type of PM role you have or want to take on. Um, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but what I wanted to show here um, was how does one measure success um, <clears throat> using the PM competencies framework. And I think the, the slides may get shared after this, hopefully, um, so you can kind of get all the juicy details. Uh, for me, when I was writing my you know, uh, promotion packets or self-assessments, um, I struggled to write down words that were like, here is my end business impact, or here is the metric I moved. And so what I developed was a framework how to, how to talk about success with my manager. And this kind of reflects a lot of those, those ideas. So across the top, you see here vision, execution, leadership, technical, so PM competencies. And now in the rows, you see as PMs, we're responsible. Success for us is two things. One, we deliver things. Second, we make uh, a business impact by delivering those things. Now, in any given month or any given quarter, uh, you may not have the opportunity to do all of that, to deliver and show business impact. Uh, and delivering, of course, is a leading indicator of business impact. But ideally, at some point, you know, any snapshot in time, the stuff we're working on is both delivering but then also we're able to measure our success and deliver business impact. And across these things, what delivering means, uh, these could be artifacts These uh, for vision setting. Again, it could be white papers, prototypes, uh, product requirements documents, and so on. Execution means we're shipping things, but running experiments could be another one. Um, leadership is about communication. So I delivered, I aligned the executive team on a strategy, or I rallied a team around an all-hands presentation I gave. That's an example of delivering on the leadership angle. Technical is doing things to uh, develop skills, getting certifications or training in areas that you may not have uh, uh, training in. And on the business impact, yes, certainly more metrics driven where it's possible. It's not always possible though to have metrics. And so on the vision side, uh, leadership alignment um, I would call that as an area of business impact. You are aligning a leadership team on where they should focus their resources. That's something to celebrate, um, and that has an impact on the business. Um, or the potential, if we do this, we believe the estimated change in our business metrics to be X. Uh, if we're able to establish a vision and demonstrate impact there, that means we're also able to tell the story of how it's gonna make the business better. Um, and then of course, if you ship stuff, ideally there's metrics attached to it, whether the customer, business, engineering, um, business impact around leadership is uh, aligning teams, thinking through employee morale, retention, uh, to that point of we are doing what's needed to lead high performing teams. Um, if we can organize offsites or uh, through our vision setting, get people really rallied around sticking around at the company or seeing things you know, one more cycle through. That's something to celebrate, that is impact. Um, and then finally on the technical side is our ability to 
understand the development process and speak the language of the builders of the product, work with them to get them unblocked, to manage that process, uh, bring efficiency to it. Um, that's all about productivity of your team. And that also is a way to talk about business impact, things you did to basically make your team more productive. So anyways, this is not a perfect framework. I'm sure I'm missing a ton in here, but hopefully it gives you some uh, inspiration. As you think about the PM competencies, ways to measure what you deliver and how it makes uh, a business impact uh, as a way to measure your success. So great, we've talked about superpowers, we've talked about uh, development areas, we've talked about um, how to uh, measure your success for the PM role you're in, the persona you're playing. Now, if it all just kind of lives up in your head, like it did for me, that's not good. Uh, there's a final step here, which is the importance of writing down your goals. And I love this, uh, I found this Dilbert, and it kind of nails uh, what I'm talking about. Um, so what does it mean to write down, uh, write down goals, and how do you frame that? Uh, how many folks here have worked with the framework of uh, OKRs, so objectives and key results? Um, so a decent number. Um, all right, so let's kind of quickly, for those who haven't, let's quickly talk about the framework here. Um, traditionally, OKRs are used to uh, write down uh, what success looks like for organizations and teams, uh, not necessarily individuals, but I'm gonna use it for how to talk about your own success. Um, I think it's a useful framework. Uh, so here's an example of a really basic, simplistic example. So uh, an objective statement is saying, qualitatively, here's what success looks like for, for me. I wanna become an amateur chef. Um, now the key results are uh, more specific, measurable, actionable, you know, like they're, they're, they're time bound. Uh, they have that kind of smart uh, framework around it. Um, and there tend to be, there's a number attached to it. So it's a way to materialize that qualitative statement. So I'm gonna cook meals five times per week is one of my key results to be a, an amateur chef. Um, I'm gonna get higher than a 95% positive feedback from at least 20 random people I pick from the street. I'm gonna be like, come over here, like eat my food. And they're gonna, 95% of the time or higher, they're gonna really love it. So that's gonna how I measure my success as an amateur chef. A really terrible example. Um, let's get to something that's more real. Um, so let's talk about work OKRs. Um, and where are we getting inspiration from this? Well, of course, one of them and the first column is my job. This is the role I'm playing for Skip. And so I'm gonna use, uh, yeah, this is a Skip example. So part of my role at Skip is I have to be driving a magical product experience and nailing all the pieces that aren't magical, finding opportunities to bring seamlessness to the, to the transportation experience, et cetera. So one though, step, one key result is I drive alignment with the executive team. So I lead an exec review where we make key decisions on uh, the fact that we need to redesign our, our mobile app. Um, and that for me is a, is a key result. Um, the second key result is we test a prototype of that mobile app with 100 alpha users um, with a really high delight score. You know, like people really love it in a sort of alpha environment. And so these two key results are part of that objective statement for me. Again, this is just my role. The second column is my development areas. These are areas that we had called out before. These are things I need to improve on or I need to get better at, you know? And if I just did the first, I would be ignoring things that I need to do to be successful in my role. And so developing hardware expertise uh, is the objective. The key result is uh, setting up regular one-on-ones with each hardware team member, really understanding what their role is, how they function, how they fit into the development process. Uh, the second is defining a plan for validating new hardware. I may not be able to, um, I may not be able to build hardware right now, but what I can do is you, you give me a new scooter, you give me a new piece of hardware, I can talk to customers and I can get their feedback on it. I can validate that this hardware works for them. And through that, I develop a learning, I integrate myself into the hardware lifecycle. And I attach, even though it may not be a, a head of product type of role, um, it's a learning opportunity for me, and I'm gonna embrace that. And that's gonna be part of my, part of my goals, what success looks like for me. Um, 
So with all of that together, there's probably going to be more here uh, for you, for your roles, but this is one way to look at it. Again, what's needed for your role? Um, what are areas that, that you want to get better at? Um, cool. So with that, talking about OKRs, we talked about competencies, superpowers, development areas, et cetera. Um, I wanted to talk through just a few uh, uh, more tactical uh, pieces of uh, just pro tips on how to grow oneself as a PM. These are just things I learned at Uber, and of course not exhaustive, uh, but I think directionally correct. One is developing a PM superpower. And again, I'm gonna use that superpower framework a lot. Uh, you bring that into, ev into your PM role. It's so important that you do that, because if you don't have this, uh, either along the lines of you deeply know the customer, or you deeply know the business, or you deeply know how to build something, it's hard to do all three from scratch in a PM role. Frankly, you're not gonna be successful in that role. So where you are looking to go into PM roles, where you aren't grounded by one or more of these things, uh, I would recommend find another PM role, to be honest with you. Um, because building that on the fly in a job from scratch is super, super hard, and those are critical to, to success in the role. Uh, the second point here is leading products from concept to customer. Uh, we can talk all day long about like, hey, to be successful as a PM, do this, do that, do that. Nothing beats just doing it. Like building product, having an idea, going through the process, building it, shipping it, rinse and repeat. The number, our growth as PMs comes from the number of at-bats we have doing products from concept to customer. So where you can do that in your free time, on the weekends, uh, or even in your work, that's, uh, that's huge. The third here is uh, observe and helping high caliber product leaders. Again, not a very easy thing to do if you're in a startup or not in a PM role, but where you have the opportunity where you say that person in my team or organization, they look like they're amazing or they're really, people say they're really good product managers where you have a chance to sit in on their meetings, observe how they talk, how they influence, how they drive discussions, how they set strategies. Nothing beats just like observing those people. I've learned a lot um, from having the, the opportunity to observe others. Um, and then ideally, don't just observe. Go grab lunch with them and, and uh, buy coffee for them and tell them, ask them how you can help them they probably have a list of things that they want to get done that they just don't have the time to do, that they need help with. Take one of those things off of them and use that as an opportunity to help and learn from them would be my recommendation. Um, that's actually how Uber's PM competencies came to be, is uh, some, uh, a leader in the org was like, we need competencies. And then I happened to be there. I was like, hey, I'll, I'll help with that. And I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, but that was an amazing, amazing opportunity. And finally, getting feedback from your manager, peers, and reports regularly. Probably stating the obvious, but uh, uh, this, I think, is uh, definitely important for growth in the role. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, uh, what, did I, what did I mean by business? Um, uh, more like the organization. Um, so if you understand both uh, if you both understand uh, the all aspects of the organization in which you work, um, kind of the key functions, who the key people are, how to get things done, um, uh, what is needed to be successful, like what are the org's uh, success metrics and what, what is needed, strategically needed for the org to be successful, that's a really valuable like perspective to have that helps you constrain what you end up building. All right, so uh, the recap. Uh, recap, again, you've already seen this over again. I'm gonna beat you over the head uh, with this framework and I hopefully I've successfully done that. Um, but a few of the kind of key, key things we talked about. One is that PMs advocate for the customer and ship products that deliver customer value. Customer, customer, customer. You do that through products and by, to build products, you work with cross-functional teams. Now the key competencies we talked through, vision, execution, leadership, and technical depth, uh, are enabling skills uh, to do that. And success isn't about nailing every single competency, 
It's about nailing the right ones for the role you're playing, for the teams you're working with, for the organizations that you're a part of. So don't, I mean, I certainly feel overwhelmed looking at all those competencies, but the point is constrain. Really focus on the ones that matter. Uh, the fourth one here is defining goals or OKRs for your role by what it is you need to deliver, uh, the business impact you need to create. We talked about ways to kind of define that and also the competencies you want to develop. So having those goals, talking uh, through it with your manager, um, and uh, finally accelerating your growth by reading, doing, observing, and soliciting feedback was the last stuff we talked about. And with that, um, that was a mouthful, thank you. Uh, Okay, I, th I think I sort of get it, but let me see if I can translate that and I may not perfectly answer your question. Uh, so abstracting this a little bit for, for the group, um, it's possible that organizations may, have already, may already have a vision. Um, so as a PM, you're not developing that from scratch, uh, but you're trying to figure out how to uh, move that vision forward uh, and uh, uh, make sure it, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, being consumed by the org uh, and being useful and, and, and moving the ball forward, roughly, <laughs> sort of, okay. Um, so, yeah, it's very possible that, you know, as we, we may not be developing the visions from scratch, you know, and uh, if you're a head of product or, you know, really senior, you might get at the point where you're, you're defining the org level vision, but more often than not, like, we're at the feature or the specific product area, you know? And uh, it may be possible that you've inherited uh, a vision that has already been set uh, by a previous PM or by someone else. Um, what I found is really important is kind of coming back to what success means in the role. Where an org has already valued basically a vision, uh, products that need to get built, shipping those things and so on, it's important for a part of our role to be delivering and demonstrating that impact, but where we feel for the longer term that that vision does need to get refreshed, um, A, it's important that that refresh is aligned with your manager or some, someone in the organization who agrees that yes, this thing needs to happen, that if you do that, then you deserve a lot of credit for it. If you don't get find that person in the organization, um, then how are you gonna actually affect this vision on anyone? You need champions, you need people who are gonna support you in that. And so that's what I found is, is important for that. I'm being, I enjoy solving technical problems, I'm an engineer, but I do think there's a lot of value in incorporating you know, ideals to your daily workflow. Um, so like besides having product empathy and being actively aware of kind of like metrics to your code, if you say so, what are like some other key takeaways that you wish engineers knew more about the end? Yeah, so the question was, uh, as an engineer, what are ways to kind of uh, embody, I guess, some like PM uh, traits or, you know, tactics uh, in order to make you a more effective uh, engineer? Uh, what's interesting is that um, I've had a chance to work with a lot of, uh, a lot of engineers, uh, technical leads, engineering managers. As uh, you go up the more management ladder within engineering or even becoming a more senior engineer, uh, the more it's important that the, the soft skills become important. Whether it's a lot of what I said around influence, uh, leading by example, not by like purely having, you know, authority, uh, defining vision, storytelling, starting with the customer, those become more and more important uh, as you uh, kind of go up the engineering track. Um, and it almost becomes to the point where if you didn't have a product manager, you could play some of that product role. You could play the product owner role. You know, not, maybe not like super long-term strategic, but you could do enough to basically define what success looks like for a product for the next quarter, two quarters, come up with a roadmap, and so on. Um, so uh, I think a lot of the principles kind of would, would map over. All right, I think we are out of time. Thank you, everybody, and let's uh, give it a round of applause.